Seriously? Yes, but I'm not going to get my hand In order to cover this answer, we'll be, uh, following the we'll be looking at the following areas. Uh, the first area we, we, where I'll be covering will be the history of copyright and, and what it is. And also I'll be covering uh, who is a copyright owner, um, owner's main interest, or what they want from, from the, the, what kind of protection regulation they want from, from the copyright law. And after, afterwards, my colleague will present the regulation protecting owner's interest. And on the other hand, we'll be looking at also for the uh, who's copyright user and uh, regulation protecting uh, copyright um, user as well. And at the end, we'll be summarizing and putting our own critical review towards the um, question. Um, first, we'll be looking at like, the history, which is like um, the modern concept of uh, uh, copyright originates back in the uh, United Kingdom uh, and was published in. It was regulated in 1710 uh, with the Statute of Anne. And during that, uh, if you get the, the, the if you granted with that with such a regulation, uh, with the copyright um, uh, right, uh, you are allowed to keep your your your, your ownership for, for 14 years, and you can uh, renew the, the the copyrighted product um, once, and the maximum level that you can be protected. During that period is 21 years. Um, the, current uh, the current copyright law was also amended over years. Like copyright have been amended uh, throughout years, and the current one was uh, as, um, regulated on the 1st of August in 1989. And the main reason uh, it has been amended is because of due, due to uh, development of technology, uh, globalization, many uh, different of views of. Access to other people's work. Therefore, this, um, uh, for example, one of the, the three elements that have been amended is the, to keep peace with the technology changes, like I, like I mentioned, and also uh, the, the new amendment has allowed uh, owners to to in, to introduce rental and lending their rights with their consent, and also introduce the moral rights of the authors. But the main reason of this re regulation is to protect an individual piece of work, of invention, or any kind of piece of work, that could be film, or literacy, books, and so on, that to protect their work uh, as much as possible from someone using it uh, for, for their own interest, whether for commercial or non-commercial. Um, however, no. <laughs> however, in order to be, in, in, order, uh, in, order, in order to be protected uh, by such regulation, there are some uh, requirement that has uh, that is necessary to, to comply with it, which is is listed under section 53 where um, where an owner must be a, a citizen of a, a UK or he must be a resident or corporate or incorporate of the UK. Um, like a, the piece of work that has that are covered are also listed under section from section three up to six just to few mentioned a few uh, such as literacy, dramatic, music works, and data links, digital, and so on. Next. Um, we'll be looking at the 
firstly, which is a pro um example of uh, breach of copyright. Uh, this, as you can see, th this case goes back uh, 300 years. Uh, the fact of this case is um, Mr. Miller, which, uh, which is a, a bookseller, the, the plaintiff, uh, uh, he, he bought a, a publication right in, in 1729, uh, which is a poem uh, 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 written by Mr. James and is known as The Season. Um, like I mentioned earlier, that during that period, in order for me to protect your, your, your period, it's up to 40 years and, so forth, and after that, you have to renew. So this, this period had uh, terminated, and Mr. Robert, which is the, the, the respondent, he began publishing his own uh, uh, competition publication using the piece of work of Mr. Thomas. And on this ground, Mr. Miller uh, uh, has um, um, sorry, ha has um, has has put Mr. Miller to, to the court uh, has saying uh, has sued. Mr. Taylor uh, for the for saying how they used the publication without an authorization, which is uh, an infringement. However, um, Taylor's argument was due to the determination of the parent that he was entitled to use the piece of work. Uh, the judge held uh, in this court saying uh, how, uh, despite the statute, uh, despite the, the, um, the publication, Despite the court decided to publish a co uh, common law right, so the, sorry, sorry. the judge decided, despite all the determination of the parent, that the ownership of this product has a gone under the common, the common law right. Therefore, this, uh, uh, therefore, they decided in favor of the Mr. Miller because uh, the publication work they acquired is, 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 is right and. Those amount of the cases, despite is, 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 is terminated, they can have. It, it's not up for the public to be used. Um, next, please. Next, please. As 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 a uh, as what as um, a plaintiff, which is Mr. Perry, which is a professor. Uh, he teaches and uh, gives out lectures to to his fellow students. So he delivered. Uh, Restriction that uh, an owner can raise under the, the, the regulation, which has, which is uh, stated under Section 16, the CDT Act uh, 1988, which the, the owner could uh, to copy the works, or he can issue the copies to the work of the public, or he can rent or lend the works to to other public sectors, or, to, or he can perform or play the, his work under. Section also he can restrict other people from using their work. Um, however, there's some confusion that creates like uh, uh, between on ownership like to know who to identify who's the owner. Because it, 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 uh, as it stated in section 11, between one and two, if the original owner, uh, let's say if an employee during his employment moment, if he publishes or he creates a film or any sort of publication during his employment process, uh, the original, the initial owner would be the, the employer. So on 
such as they, despite they created the work, the initial one that makes it This is another uh, proponent example of infringement copyright, uh, which I find a bit, uh, a bit interesting. Um, Hoffman is, uh, is a defendant, um, I mean, the defendant company, uh, which is a drug abuse resistance, which is um, a charity organization, are there to, to, to raise awareness of substance abuse to young uh, students. And they claim that Mr. H was a photographer. And H claimed that from 2004, the defendant's website used 19 photographs of various drugs that had been taken by Mr. Hoffman, the, the plaintiff. And he claimed that uh, the images was copyrighted uh, photographs used without his permission on the website. Hence, the, plaint the, plaint the plaintiff sued the, de the defendant under Section 16, the CDP Act 1988, 16, and 20, um, where he, he said, um, however, the defendant tried hard to say he just uh, um, hired a website creators and they just pub uh, published, uh, they just gave him a piece of work and that he was responsible for it. But the court held saying uh, that he is responsible for the infringement because under this, uh, because of the uh, infringement of the copyright limit under Section 20, where under Section 20 says communicated to the public of the, uh, the work and act restric restricted by the copyright, like uh, without the consent of a person who can publish a, a, a pub publish uh, copyrighted piece of work to the public. Consent or didn't give them permission as an infringement. Um, the following case that we're going to be looking at is Don and uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Oh, yeah. yeah, and and the newspaper of TV. Um, this is a very interesting case where a plaintiff, Mr. Stephen Don, is a very famous uh, horse um, racer. A series of articles entitled to the plaintiff. Racing Secret was published in the newspaper. <coughs> Mr. F, which is an employee from the newspaper, newspaper company, has written an article. And during his, uh, when, while he was writing the article, he asked, um, he asked um, the plaintiff to, to, to give him some advice on sentencing on his personal life, because the article that he was written was on his personal life. And Mr. <coughs> which is he, uh, he agreed and gave him all uh, necessary uh, information. And before the publication, uh, Mr. F uh, had asked the plaintiff to, to, to uh, actually he read the article for the, for the plaintiff and then the alteration was suggested by, by the plaintiff. Therefore, um, despite the plaintiff was not the owner or the joint of the copyrighted work, Surprisingly, uh, the ownership was 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 gone to the to the plaintiff because of um, Act of 1999, 1911, Section Six, which says any action of infringement of copyright in any work, the work shall be presumed to the work in which copyright access. In another word, if any kind of work is being created um, by the owner or has been used on the storyline of the, the person or, or something related to, to the, I don't know if I'm explaining it right, but if it's related to that person, the ownership or the, or the authorship be the, 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 the actual person that concerns the, the story. Uh, on the following slide, we have a my comment. Um, okay. uh, actually, it's very good. Um, before we go, uh, there's, there's another slide I'm going to cover as well. Um, before we go further, uh, we need to know what is the ownership main interest under the copyright. So what, what he is trying to uh, get from the copyright and the reservation. So the main thing is they want to uh, protect their work. And at the same time, they want to prevent from people using their, their work Same time, they want to make money as well out of it by by being the only supply or the source of the publication. And furthermore, depending on the nature of their goods, they want their work to be um, protected and kept original for uh, reasonable.
being the first owner of a copyright, a person, a person has the exclusive right to exercise right uh, to exercise the acts restricted by copyright. And and section 16 of the CDPA states that owners have the right to copy and issue the work, rent or lend the work, perform or publicize the work, or make an adaptation of the work. So a copyright owner has the right to issue a license to another to exercise any of the restricted acts above or through authorizing another person. And this can be seen in the case of CBS Sons Limited and Amstrad. So basically, what this case is talking about is about um, CBS, a record company, um, bringing an action against Amstrad, uh, and they're like a, they manufacture like a hi-fi system where uh, any person can um, copy um, copy from a recorded cassette to an empty cassette. So. Um, CBS songs claim that um, Amstrad, that Amstrad um, enables buyers rates uh, enables buyers or individuals of, to pirate unlicensed copy of this copy of their copyright work. And they claimed Amstrad should claim the ability as a joint infringer of the copyright. And they took this case uh, Amstrad took this case to the Court of, of Appeal first. But it was dismissed. But it later went on to the House of Lords, and the House of Lords held that that even though the even though the respondents that um, Amstrad fa facilitated the public with the machines that they manufactured, they did not authorize them to commit infringement of copyright law, since they did not even have the right to do so. So, so they were not liable. Amstrad was not liable. So um, next, um, I'm going to talk about uh, how the, um, the, le the re legislation protects an individual. No, okay. And like the, the next, I'm going to talk about probably start, start this statutory protection provides copyright owners through primary infringements, and this is seen in and this is seen in section 22 to 26 of the CDPA. And this occurs, this um, secondary infringement occurs when an individual or an organization helps or allows another individual to infringe on a copyright. Also, the Act also provides copyright owners through primary infringement rules as well. And for a primary infringement to occur, there must have been a direct infringement from an individual of an exclusive right. And this infringement may occur when one of the restricted acts is breached by the infringer, such as copying under Section 17 of the of the CDPA. And and this and um, an example of copying is seen in, in the case of designer guy and Russell. And basically, this case basically this case is about um, designer guy uh, making the design designer like. They're an artist, they made a design or a picture or which, which was quite similar. They made a picture and they and they sold it as their own copy. And Russell actually found out about that later on and sent them a and sent them a, a drawing of the design, which is their one, and a letter stating that they that they infringe on, on their copy, on the copyright. So and um, this case basically, the, what was held in this case was that the test was to assess if the infringer has incorporated a considerable amount of skill used by the author. And this, uh, and this test basically, it's about, uh, it, this test depends on how, depends on how far the difference between the taking of his ideas and the taking of expression, um, which is part of the, that would be the first question. And whether there were uh, whether there's been actual copying, and as well as secondly, again, whether what has been copied is a substantial part. So that's what the test is about. And also, um, other restricted acts.
acts, on, acts under the primary infringement include issuing copies to the public, which is, which is under se Section 18 of the CDP Act, and performing, showing, or playing the work in public, which, which, is, which falls under Section 19 of the Act, and broadcasting the work or including it in the cable program service, which is under Section 20 of the Act. <clears throat> and finally, making an adaptation, which falls under Section 21 of the Act. Okay, and um, the regulations continue in this page. And an individual can infringe a copyright work through secondary infringement. And this occurs when an individual or organization facilitates another individual to infringe on the copyright. And this is seen under section 22 to 26 of the Act. And as seen in the case of LAG and high tech sports. So basically, what this case is about is. Uh, uh, an employee of um, LAG actually made a design, a shoe design, and um, high tech, high tech noticed it and sent them, and sent the letter and the drawing stating they copied them. Um, so the what was there was that the employee was infringing on the copyright, and the court stated that the, the significance of the use of the objective test and the object. The, the objective test here is that uh, that LAG um, that um, high tech um, just put in uh, high tech put in um, giving them a notice wasn't uh, would not be enough and the fact was that uh, and the fact was the sort that enables a reasonable person to to arrive at the to arrive at the belief that the drawing the drawing was designed on which was which was an infringing was an infringing copy. The drone of design was an infringing copy. And and high tech relying on the written notice they sent to LAG, the the courts assume that it has the, the court might assume that it has come to the defender the, <coughs> the to LAG's attention that three weeks from the date of the from when the letter was sent. So that's the objective test. And Continuation of the regulations protecting owners' rights. Um, also, a different way the law protects owners' interest of making profits is seen in, second, in circumstances where it transfers is um, where it transfers the rental rights in specific kind of works. And this this is this can be seen in like sound sound recordings or films where the rights are transferred to a producer. And <clears throat> section three ninety eight. State that a copyright owner is entitled to equitable remuneration in accordance to this setting. And this can be seen in the case of FAPL and QC Asia. And also, I'm going to summarize both cases and Murphy and Media Production because they both, they both got the same circumstance. And the fact of these two cases together is that uh, is the use of uh, a foreign decoder devices to to uh, screen, uh, to descript satellite TV service or, uh, and the case concerned like a, a British pub owner who used uh, a Greek satellite to screen matches in a pub instead of using Sky. And the, and the Premier League, like the FAPL, they actually, they, they screen the, F, the, Premier, the Premier League football match. And the, and this is, and the FAPL actually had, they sold their right to uh, to broadcast games like uh, the Sky and ESPN. So they claimed, uh, um, uh, they, they, in both cases, they claimed that they, they claimed the defendants actually infringed on their on their rights of copy, they infringed on their right of copyright, and they took about. But the defendant in both cases stated that they are lawful under the EU directive, and they they brought a case against them. But the court actually ruled in their favour, saying that they are such exclusive agreements were contrary to EU laws on free trade. Okay, and finally, I'm going to be talking about remedies available to copyright owners in cases of infringement. And this can be seen in section 96 to 100 of the CDPA Act. And these remedies can be awarded, and the, the awards for these remedies are 
first damages. Uh, this is this can be awarded when it, uh, like when it is too remote to provide the copyright owner with an adequate compensation. Also, injunction, and this is for stopping uh, individuals trying to copy and infringe from creating infringed copies and finding and the right to seize the infringed copies. Um, and this happens. Uh, this is given in order to prevent infringers of um, for download for actions like um, like if uh, if like uh, probably like a book is copied and it's been sold or something like that. Um, the copyright owner has the right to seize all the books from being sold and uh, prevent the infringer from copying and gaining on on his work. I'm going to be taking off for now, and what I'm going to be talking about is who is a copyright user. A copyright user is someone who's someone like me and you, public, who will use someone's work, which is under them, so something that's been created by someone else and is copyrighted. To them. However, a user is someone like me and you who would probably read it or listen to music or something along those lines. So that's the user there. There's two types of copyright users. There's a commercial purpose, so a user would use it for commercial purposes. And then there's a user who uses it for non-commercial purposes. In, in using it for a commercial purpose, you're using it in course of business, so as a way of maybe generating sales or just generally it's not, you're not using it just for the final reason, you're using it to make profit or part of your business or operation or something along those lines. A uh, user for non-commercial purposes is a user who does the complete opposite, doesn't use it for any business purposes or sales or anything like that, they just want to be using it just for the month themselves or just any other circumstances. Just uh, to come back from the previous slide, there's a key point where in order to use it for commercial purpose, you have to obtain a license from the copyright owner, so copyright seat, so that's only if you want to be the commercial purposes user. So, yeah, thank you. A case um, which I'm going to mention is NLA no quarter, where under, just before I get into that, Section 28A states that in order to state a copyright work in a literary work other than a computer program, database, dramatic, or musical, artistic work is not infringed by making of a temporary copy. Keyword there is temporary copy, which I'll come back to in this case of NLA Melkulta, where what happened was Melkulta was provided online media and sent emails to subscribers with data and headlines. So that's data on those lines. And NLA actually claimed that the end users, so the subscribers who were getting these emails, required required a license to view this data. However, they required to view this data on a computer, so once it came up on the screen, they, were, they needed the license. That's what NLA's argument was. However, what was held initially, the High Court agreed with this and said that yes, they did need the license because of the temporary copies created, the cash temporary copies created on a computer. However, the Supreme Court disagreed. An interesting point is the Supreme Court said that the script, the on-screen copies which were cached and made straight away was a, was a systematic technological process which happens with every computer. So in order to have a license for that, you're, that you simply cannot, that millions of people around the world who are using the internet were viewing screens where there's temporary copies made. You cannot, you cannot put, a, put a license to that, you simply cannot. So this affected internet users significantly as there is no restriction, the internet is free and you do not need to get permission from anyone to view the items which are where temporary copies are made. So that was that point there. Regulations protecting, I'm going to continue on that first, looking at section 29 where again it looks at purposes of research on commercial purposes, it does not infringe any copyright laws. And that was seen in Her Majesty's versus Green Amps where what happened was uh, green amps produced energy from wind turbines and they, re they, required, they required a new site and they were looking at, they needed a document which had the Digi map service and that was licensed to only users, so only licensed users had access to that document. However, what happened was they made an unauthorized access to this piece of document as they acted as a student and obtained student um, details and accessed it on the university website to get, off, to get away from get basically cool. And what happened was being what what was held was it did not they seek protection from 29. So and it was not for it was for non-commercial purposes because the dealing was unfair. There was clear sort of exploitation.
implementation of Cochra work. And you might be wondering why I'm saying this in terms of pro-users, because that's the there's a fine level of difference when it comes to users, protect, users being protected, because because the was unfair, they were not protected. Um, another key point I'm going to look at is section 30, where it talks about fair dealing, on the other hand. So that includes for criticism or review. But, um, so we can, what this is trying to say is you can use someone else's copyright work if your purpose is for criticism or review. And the case which displayed that was the case of Fraser Woodward versus BBC Bright, Bright, Bright's Pictures, where what happened was the claimant for copyright infringements. Sorry, the, the defendant took 14 photographs of Victoria Beckham. So therefore, Victoria Beckham, it's her picture, she's the, she's, she's the entire, she's got the copyright because it's her. And what happened was, she did not want these pictures to be published. However, they did get published. And it was, however, the court held, interestingly enough, that because the defendant, which was a uh, bright picture, they said they're using it for um, critical review and um, criticism, and the court supported them in that in the sense that yes, they are using it for criticism. So here we have someone who's had their picture taken, and they did not get permission to get published. However, just because they, the person who took the picture said, I'm going to use it for criticism, the court supported them in that, and they actually, they, yeah, the, the defendant couldn't, was actually successful, and the court held that as well. So that, that was quite interesting. This section I'm going to be looking at is 32, where it's looking at the copyright and the literary dramatic musical is not infringed in the case of instruction or preparing for instruction. So in a, in a case, so that's where they're using it for educational purposes. So you can present copyright in educational institutes, copyright material in educational institutes such as universities, colleges, as long as it's the purpose for for education and instruction. It's not the purpose for commercial commercial purposes or anything leading along those lines of it. Yeah. So just to conclude from both sides, we thought that there was a balanced level of protection for both owners and users in terms of infringement and the parts of that legislation that covers both areas in terms of protection. And we thought, however, we thought that owners of interest Yeah, it, it leans slightly towards the owners who get more protection because we felt that it was their work, so that's why they would be getting more, more protection. However, we thought that something that justified that was if, like, no one can use the material for, com for commercial purposes. There is no given for that, and you have to get a license for that. However, there, there have been cases, as I mentioned before, where users have somehow, where it does, it is a bit of a grey area where users have used it, but they, they were protected. So we thought there was a balanced, balanced, uh, balanced look over it. However, there have been cases where it seems that owners get more protection. And yeah, any questions? <laughs> I have two. I have two. Yeah, 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 I do. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. I just wanted to, I just wanted to know the outcome of that FA and PL case. That, like, who was it in favour for that? Which one? The Bulgarian one. I was on TV. Uh, Murphy versus media. Is that, is it, that was Greek TV, I think. That was in favour of the. the uh, yeah, that, that, that. I think this one, right? Yeah. yeah. Which one? The FAPL one. Who was it in favour for? Uh, for the Asia thing. Okay. No, I, I'm just not sure. And secondly, um, so you're talking about how un, like, there's statistics being like being unfair and fair use of. Yeah. Someone's got right in the face. Um, so in, in your opinion, do you think that's fair? That that thin line that like do you think so, 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 so when you're talking about unfair and fair um, uses for, 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 for us basically, do you think that thin that thin line is fair and maybe you think it may bias towards the owners that you said? Is that where you think it's biased? Well we, we yeah, we think it is there is a fine line, yeah. and that's what distinguishes it, because who how can you define what's fair and what's unfair? It depends on the purposes and the circumstances. And that's why we thought it does slightly lean towards the owners because you can hold on and say, hold on, I don't give permission 
or you're using it for commercial purposes, but then the user can also turn around yeah. and say, I'm using it to criticize. Do you think that swings it though? With Sorry? commercial purposes, do you think that would swing? If it's for commercial purposes and there's been no, and it's been proven to yeah. be for commercial purposes and there's been no permission granted, then of course it goes into our own space straight away. But it's not too good. Yeah. Anything else? Thanks. Yeah. Yes. I must say two things. First, A, I like the way the press presentation has been very colourful and interesting to know. Secondly, I very much like, and um, which I think others should have emulated this, is A, use of the black letter law on instances where it is, you are stating the black letter law, and the cases, very well researched cases. So it's going, you see a lot of widespread from the 1700s to the latest cases. So it shows that there is a lot of hard work which has gone in. Uh, also another uh, overall feedback is more or less all three of you have, have understood the content pretty well. Uh, that's very good. So in keeping with these three broad feedback, let me just go over a few questions which I have not many. Uh, it was about how finding the cases for some points as well. Um, okay, next step. Okay, next. Mm. So here, the point two uh, that is uh, exceptions for ownership under section 11, 1 and 2. And you spoke about uh, being under employment. Yeah, if you create the uh, works. What is the reason behind that? The reason there's a contractual agreement between an employee and an employer uh, when you work. Uh, if, if you're working under someone, despite you're creating it on behalf of, because you're, you're actually creating the, the work or the, the, the any interaction that you're making on behalf of the owner. So that's. So what is the reason? So, so there's, an agreement, I... there's an employment contractual agreement between. The and the employee that any, any sort of um, creation that has been conducted for the purpose of employment. You are telling me the way. Yeah. Copyright is one way and contract is another way. Both are applied together. But what is the reason behind it? Well, the reason behind it? I think one of the reasons is that as an employer, I mean, I, I do think it is slightly a bit unfair, even because the employee might be printed for himself, it might not be for commercial purposes. Uh, the reason I think is because employers see it as you're working for me, that's why it's, it's I, I, I own it basically, which I think should be looked at in more depth. Because so the underlying reason is exploitation of the work? That's right, yeah, that's what I mean when it's, it's if unfair. You, if, if, the, if the employee is given ownership of his or her works, then as an employer who is paying you remuneration, paying you, you know, pension, etc., all yeah. of the benefits, will not be able to exploit it if as an employer I say, oh, I don't want you to exploit my work without my permission. Yeah, but that, in this case, it's not happening straight away. It's saying that it is the employer. So that's why I said it's quite unfair towards an employee because they created it. It's their hard work that's gone into it. I don't think it's unfair. Despite they created it, but there's, there's an agreement between the employer and the employee they're working for the employer. So I don't know how to explain it any further, but if you're working under someone, the ownership relies on the employer. And that's what the, the law protects as well. I think if the employer was to create something which goes against the interest of the employer in terms of business commercial wise, then I think the employer does have a right to say, well, you work for me and then create something that's, you know, Possibly going to affect my business, and so I think that is a bit contradicting. But when it comes to like, like for example, like musical work or history or creativity, then I think it's unfair upon the employee because it's not affecting the employer. Okay. What about apart from this? What about say works which have been commissioned? Say for example, I'm a photographer. Work which is on a commission by commission basis. And you, Daviola, is uh, a famous uh, actress. She has commissioned me to take photographs. Now, in this scenario, who will be the owner of those photographs? Who does the exception of author being the first owner? Does it apply? So, so 
picture of the city. So, okay, I'll repeat. Daniel Mel is a famous actress. Okay. I am a photographer. She has commissioned a work. I, she has asked me, she's paying money, and she said that you take 10 photographs of me. That's it. So, in that case, who owns the copyright in the photograph? Are we, are we saying the photographer is a freelance photographer working for a whole? Yes, a freelance photographer. A freelance photographer. photographer. Yeah. I would say then it belongs to the freelance photographer because he doesn't have an employer, he's working for himself and the copyrights are with him because he's taking the picture and he's been given permission by the actress to, take it, to get pictures taken of. So, so, under, so under the CDPA, what category does it fall in? It is under that exception that you are mentioning, section 11 itself. Is it works by commissioned works? It would be, yeah. It would be so there are two types of exceptions under Section 11. One is uh, employee employee relationship, yeah, and, and the uh, second is commission. Yeah? Yeah. So you are right. I just want you to tell me what it is under the copyright language. Yeah. Next. Is invention the right term to be used when we talk about copyright? A copyright as a law? I would say if, right. if it wasn't, I would say you could always <laughs> call it like an ISPAR or, or an owner of the copyright. Is, 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 uh, at the end of the day, copyright, is, is when you get copyright ownership, is to protect you your own creativity, right? So there's no invention. Yeah, so creative. As I have introduced in class, intellectual property has, there are six, seven types of IP. Does copyright as a framework protect the invention, i.e. the ideas, or the expression of the ideas? Expression, expression of the ideas. Exactly. So invention as a term falls under which type of IP? They manufacture the machine used for copying from one cassette to another. Yeah, I understand the fact. My question is what type of infringement was Amstrad accused of um, joint infringement of copyright? Like the and they are like enabling. Yeah, so if it is enabling, what type of infringement is it? Are you doing the infringement yourself or are you authorizing? Uh, the, uh, no, no, they're no, authorizing. No, 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 no. So you're authorizing? No, no, no. Yeah, you're letting so people to, to contact us. Exactly, so is it secondary infringement or primary infringement? Secondary. Secondary. Okay. So, in keeping with that, if you go to the next slide, you talk about the primary infringement, right? Yeah. Where is the section regarding secondary infringement? It's on the left. And where is the CBS versus Amstrad case here? So uh, the CBS versus Amstrad case is one of the defining cases regarding secondary infringement, i.e. authorization. Because uh, I already said it. It doesn't matter. Because one case can illustrate many things. But it's a good case. You have at least understood the case more or less. It's just that it should have been repeated here. No, yeah. okay. that was the first time. Yeah. 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 Go back to the previous slide. Um, uh, do you know the name of the design in the Designers Guild case, which was being, which was, uh, which the court held to be infringed um, by the late uh, Alan 
that line for that for that one. Margaret. So Margaret, who was the line? Oh, it was actually a um, designer girl that actually designed it and named it as, as their own. Mm. Yes, so. so there was Margaret design and there was a Pixia design. Um, I don't know the design. I think they were the, I don't know the design of Russell. I, I don't know the name for the set they copied their own. Okay, so what was the design and why did they why did they hell that it was copied? Uh, the design actually had like uh, they had some kind of similarities. The yeah. strike striking yeah, similarities. Kind of like the original. A picture or something. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it had so much similarity, but there was some differences as well. But I think the thing with this case is the differences were not substantial because they were because the similarities were more substantial, they were more significant and more prominent because it was a lot of people, piece of artwork, was it? Yeah. Yeah, that's why it stuck out more. It was a very simple flower design yeah. which was in columns, you know, in um, equal spaces in columns. Mm -hmm. But what you have what you have Rohit has explained is that, that because the dissimilarities were more than the similarities, that's why there was no substantial difference. Right to reproduction, right to distribution, public performance, all. 